Well, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all for taking time out of your day uh, and, and all your busy life to, to talk with me uh, about the program. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Coyne. I am a professor of economics uh, at George Mason University, and I'm also the online MA director. Uh, and I should also mention that uh, I'm an alum of the program, so I, I did both my master's and my PhD at George Mason. I, I entered the program in 2001, and I finished uh, a joint master's and PhD in 2005. Uh, and after uh, heading uh, to Southern Virginia and then West Virginia for several years, I, I came, came back home to George Mason in 2010, and I've been here since. And so uh, I, I have a, a, a deep uh, uh, knowledge of our graduate programs, but also uh, uh, I, they, they are near and dear to my heart uh, because I'm a product of the program. And so I, I feel comfortable answering your questions honestly uh, and with uh, knowledge both as a student and now as a faculty member. And so Stephanie, if you can uh, advance us uh, a slide. Uh, I wanna just say something about our Department of Economics. And I know many of you probably have some knowledge of this, but perhaps not. Uh, and George Mason uh, is a really unique place for studying economics. We are the only school in Virginia and one of few schools throughout the country that has two Nobel laureates uh, in economics. Uh, one's James Buchanan and one's Vernon Smith. And so when I think about the Masonomics tradition, I really think of, of three kind of names. Uh, of course, there's many influences on the faculty here, but in terms of our, our department, uh, one influence is F.A. Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in 1974. And you know the Department of Economics is relatively young, so it started in the 1980s. And Hayek came and spoke, I think the video's up on YouTube if you're interested in this kind of stuff, of, of him giving this talk in the early 80s. Uh, but, but he uh, was a part of kind of the influence and inspiration for the department. And so, uh, a, a key kind of aspect of our program uh, emphasizes Hayek, emphasizes market process theory, uh, and there's an elective course in the program called market process theory, which is inspired by that. The second is James Buchanan, who I mentioned earlier. He won the Nobel Prize in 1986 while he was a faculty member at George Mason, and he is uh, considered one of the founding fathers of public choice economics. Uh, and so we have an elective course in the program uh, called Public Finance and Public Choice Economics, which uh, takes its inspiration from Buchanan. And then finally, we have Vernon Smith, who won the Nobel Prize again when he was on the faculty here in 2002. And Vernon Smith is one of the founding fathers of experimental economics. And so we have uh, also an elective on the books for the online program uh, called Experimental Economics, inspired by, by Vernon Smith. And so I wanted to mention that because it's a very rich and unique tradition uh, one of a kind, in fact, but also as we progress through our discussion this, this evening and get to the course listing later, as you see these courses come up in the elective section, and, and I can say more about each of them during the Q&A if you're interested, uh, you can kind of tie that back to that rich tradition that's at the foundation of our department. Uh, Stephanie, please. And so what do we do and, and what's the value of economics? Well, I view it uh, or the way I think about it, my colleagues in economics think about it, is really kind of four quadrants. And, and these aren't mutually exclusive, they, they can overlap. Uh, and uh, of course, what we do and what we train our students to do is engage in uh, academic analysis or, or scholarship. And of course, having a deep appreciation and understanding of both the theoretical foundations of economics, as well as the applied component is crucial for uh, being a, a scholar. And so we prov provide that foundation. Related to that is uh, policy. Uh, and uh, again, having both a, a deep theoretical understanding, but also the ability to do applied work is crucial for policy. And so a lot of the work that my colleagues do uh, in economics has this uh, overlap between academic scholarship, but also having uh, policy implications for uh, really important issues issues that uh, are central to human well-being and human flourishing. And in a few minutes later in, the, in my brief presentation, I'll come back and give you a concrete example of what that might look like. The other two things we do is public communications and outreach. And so our department places a premium on communication. 
the way we think about economics is that economics is not simply meant for those who are sitting in the ivory tower, those who are in academics. Uh, certainly that's important as I just mentioned, but we place a premium on being able to communicate economic ideas to academics, to policymakers, but also to the general public. What are some examples of this? Well, one is my colleague, my, my former colleague who unfortunately passed away uh, 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 a couple of years ago, Walter Williams. Walter Williams was a, a master communicator of, of economics, uh, both in uh, uh, media, uh, so television, radio, but also uh, in written form in, in his uh, weekly columns and so on. Uh, and if you've ever tried to communicate complex economic concepts in a 500 word op-ed or a 750 word op-ed, you really realize how difficult it is, but it's really important to have that skill. And so one of the things that you'll see throughout the program is the opportunity to develop not just a understanding of concepts, not just applying them, we do that too, but also there's lots of opportunities to engage in various writing projects and writing uh, uh, opportunities, oftentimes very short to kind of practice and hone that skill to be able to take concepts and applications and distill them down into a concise and clear uh, uh, kind of product that can be widely understood. And then of course, teaching. We place a premium on uh, uh, teaching economics to empower people to uh, kind of uh, uh, incorporate and apply economics as part of their analytical toolkit. And one of the really uh, great things about economics is that it is not a field that is narrowly constrained. And what do I mean by that? You know, one of the questions I often get is, well, what can we do with the degree in economics? And the, and the answer, uh, uh, which some people might find uh, uh, unsatisfying because it's quite broad, but it's accurate, is pretty much anything you want. So we've had students who are high school teachers. One of the courses they often teach is AP economics. So they're going back to get a master's degree in economics. We've had students who are working in uh, various development organizations, the World Bank, the IMF. We've had people who are in consulting. We've had entrepreneurs who are running their own businesses and lots of other fields. So it's quite a diverse uh, a set of backgrounds. And I think that's because economics is a way of thinking. It's an analytical set of tools that can be applied to all walks of life. And so from that standpoint, it's quite empowering uh, because it will kind of set the stage, if you will, to allow you to pursue a variety of different uh, uh, fields and uh, uh, kind of career aspirations, depending on, on what, it, what it is that you want to accomplish. Uh, Stephanie, please. So here's an overview. And let me say a little bit about the program itself. So now that I've given you that background, the master's in economics is a 30 credit course, a uh, 30 credit program, pardon me, each course is three credits, so it's 10 courses. Uh, and the way it's broken down is there are five required classes, what we call core classes that everyone has to take, and then a capstone that is required. That's the last course you take. And then uh, in between, you have uh, uh, four electives that you need to take. And the way we've structured this is to kind of set it up to choose your own adventure. And so we, we wanted to empower students to be able to select from a, a catalog of electives that offered uh, uh, different perspectives and different points of emphasis. Some are more conceptual, some are more applied. And uh, we uh, set it up this way purposefully to allow students to focus on those things that interest them. And as I mentioned earlier, when I was going through that history of the department, uh, you can see in our elective courses, uh, experimental economics, market process theory, and, and public economics and public choice, and that's capturing that tradition. We also have a causal inference cost course, which is another applied uh, uh, statistics slash econometrics course for those who are interested in it, uh, and a comparative economic systems course for those who are interested in uh, economics, uh, economic development or institutions. That's what that course gets at. And so there's lots of opportunities for students to customize what it is that they want, while all of you have a very firm foundation in economics. And so if you look at the core classes, uh, we have one course, and, and again, these are required. We have one course in econometrics. Uh, and so that's teaching you uh, uh, applied econometrics. We have a sequence in microeconomics, so microeconomic theory one and two. 
we have a, a macroeconomic theory course and then a mathematics uh, or math econ course. Uh, and um, that's not necessarily the order you take them in. That's, that's ordered by course number, uh, but that's the, the, the sequence. Oh, excuse me, that's the, the courses that you uh, will end up taking. Uh, the sequence is actually uh, uh, math econ first to make sure that you have those skills down and then you trans transition into micro uh, economics and then so on through those core classes before getting to the electives. And the capstone course, which I can say more about during the Q&A, but I'll just uh, kind of hint at what it entails uh, to give you an overview, it, it's a course that ties everything in the program together. And so it is a overview course and, and largely self-directed. And what I mean by that is that students have a lot of leeway to select the topic of the project that they want to uh, uh, carry out. Uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll stop there, uh, but I can certainly say more about that during, during the Q&A. And I can give you two examples of projects that students have done to give you a concrete example of the type of things that, that you can do. Uh, but for now, we'll move on. So I mentioned earlier our faculty. All right, and here are a couple examples. I'm keep in the back of your mind those four quadrants that I mentioned earlier of the things we emphasize in our program, because I, I think this really uh, 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 emphasizes and clarifies those points. And so my colleague, Tyler Cowan, along with uh, my other colleague, Alex Tabarak, run uh, uh, marginal Revolution. Marginal Revolution is among the most popular and most well-read, if not the most well-read economics blog there is. Uh, and um, Tyler and Alex are masters of doing what I mentioned earlier. They're masters of taking complex concepts in economics and applying them to a whole host of different topics kind of more traditional economics topics, monetary theory, interest rates, all that type of stuff, but also things like culture. You can see the post that I, I happen to select here is about Top Gun, uh, the movie. Uh, and they talk about uh, all these things through the lens of economics. And they're great at communicating and engaging a, 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 a very broad and wide audience. Then if you look down uh, at the bottom of the screen, this is a, a article or excuse me, a, a uh, screenshot of testimony that my colleague Thomas Stratman uh, gave uh, uh, regarding uh, what's called Certificate of Needs Laws in Georgia. And it came out of scholarship, academic scholarship he had done. So remember I said earlier that one of the things our, our department I think does extremely well is bridge the uh, connection between academic scholarship and policy. Here's an example of this. So what Thomas did is a study of certificate of need laws. And if you don't know what a certificate of need law is, what it is is in, in states, in the United States, uh, and it varies from state to state what the laws are, to open a medical facility. So a hospital, you need to go through a board of regulators and get approval. It's called a certificate of need law. Uh, and the idea behind it is that you want regulators to make sure that uh, uh, that resources are not being diluted, there's not too many hospitals, uh, and to make sure that there's high quality hospitals. But what Thomas pointed out in his academic research, well, wait a second, by raising the cost of starting a new hospital, you also increase barriers to entry. So you reduce competition. And so that leads to an empirical question, which is, is the benefits of restricting entry through regulations to get a higher quality product. Well, there's cost to that. So is that, does the benefit from that outweigh the, the benefit of states where you don't have certificate of need laws? You can just start a hospital if you wanna start one. And what they find is that certificate of need laws uh, lead to lower quality healthcare uh, and fewer options for people. So what they find is that the kind of the barriers to entry argument uh, outweighs the benefits of regulating hospitals through restricting entry. And you can see why this matters. You can see why it matters. Why does it matter? Because healthcare is one of the most important things for human well being and human flourishing. And if you are adopting policies which restrict healthcare access, which provide lower quality service to citizens, to patients, that's going to reduce their overall a quality of life. And so you can see why this is so important. And so I highlight this example 
because it really nicely captures the ability of economics to both engage in straight up academic scholarship, but also for that to feed into to real and lively policy conversations that matter for human well-being. And then the final uh, uh, thing I just wanted to highlight is this book, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. My colleague Peter Betke is a co-author on it. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a book called Public Governance and the Class Global Perspective. And it's a book on public administration. Uh, and so the reason I wanted to highlight this is because I think this book nicely captures the interdisciplinary nature of our department. And so Pete and his co-authors are all trained as economists, but they have written a book on public administration. And so for those of you who are interested in those type of issues, public administration, government uh, type activity and government work, you can see how the type of scholarship and policy work and communication that my colleagues do really traverse a, a, a right, wide array of disciplines. And I should also mention that Pete developed the comparative economic systems course that I mentioned earlier, and Thomas Stratman uh, developed the public economics course and causal inference co course. And so these course, th these faculty that I'm highlighting were active participants in the development uh, of the classes that compose the program. Stephanie, please. So here I wanna say a couple words about the structure of the program and kind of give you a behind the, the, uh, behind the scenes look because you know, an online program is unique if you've never been in one before. And so I mentioned the structure. I said, look, it's 30 credits, 10 classes. I've talked about what the classes are, but let's delve a little deeper into what exactly this looks like and entails. And so one of the things I wanna be really clear about with this program by design, and, and it's the, the main reason many of, uh, of you are attracted to the program is that the course structure is largely asynchronous. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you went to a traditional undergrad or you've been in another graduate program in, in the traditional on the ground type format, you know, you had classes every Monday or every Monday and Wednesday at certain times and you had to show up and you had to uh, uh, participate in the class at those times. Uh, and it was a regular synchronous structure. Uh, the course courses that constitute this program are designed as asynchronous by design. We wanted to give students greater flexibility to be able to take this program uh, or the courses that constitute this program and have maximum flexibility given your commitments at work, given your commitments at home uh, or other commitments in life. And so there's a structure to it. There's modules that are structured on a week-to-week on a -week basis. And there's content that you have to go through on a week-to-week -week or module-to-module -module basis. But within that, it's oftentimes, for most of the courses, largely self-structured. And so you can do everything on Monday. You can spread it out a little bit over several days. Uh, and you have some flexibility built into that in order to uh, adjust as you need to. And so one of the, the strengths of the program is that flexibility. And when we talk to students who are in the program and who have graduated the program, this is one of the things that they highlight that they greatly valued about the program, which is, is that it allowed them to kind of balance everything they had going on in life and be able to take classes. And so these are screenshots of two of the courses. That's me in the top there. Uh, and so this is from the market process theory class. I designed two classes in the uh, program microeconomics one, microeconomic theory one, and uh, market process theory. And in the bottom corner is my colleague Joanna Mullerstrom. Um, this is from her uh, uh, gender econ class. She designed both uh, the applied econometrics class and the gender economics class. And so, as you can see, and this is just a small sample of what's included in these courses, there's professionally made videos. There are lecture slides and content, oftentimes narrated. And then oftentimes there's interactive exercises uh, for the students to, to walk through, to get a visual illustration of key concepts and key ideas. And that's what that visual in the bottom, uh, the one directly below my screenshot is showing. And so the, the courses are designed, uh, again, for you to have maximum flexibility, but also for the content to be presented to you 
in a variety of different formats, uh, videos, uh, lectures, readings, uh, uh, visuals, uh, all meant to kind of triangulate the learning experience uh, to ensure that uh, uh, you're getting uh, access to the concepts from a variety of different perspectives and in a variety of different formats. Now, I should say, even though the course, the program is designed to be asynchronous, many of the courses have a synchronous component that is optional. And so let me give you a, an example from my own experience. I just finished teaching the microeconomic theory one course. Literally, uh, Sunday was the final exam. And in that class, so it was asynchronous module to module, but I had built in optional live Zoom meetings, very much like what we're doing now. No points for attending, no requirement to attend. Students could come if they wanted to. They could drop in for 10 minutes if they wanted to during the time and then drop out. And some did. Uh, and it was nice because it was very casual. It was low pressure. Some students asked me questions about class content. Others just came and chatted about uh, their career and uh, uh, or things that interested them from the news. And uh, there was no agenda. And uh, that's how I did it. Some of my colleagues might do it more structured uh, uh, in order to uh, meet uh, the demands of their students that are particular to that class. But I just wanted to give you that sense as well that even though the program is designed to be asynchronous, which I wanna make sure I'm clear about, many of the classes do have an optional synchronous component uh, involved. And of course, one of the other things that really comes out uh, uh, of a lot of these cohorts that come in is they form study groups. And so one of the things that I've really come to appreciate, I didn't know when we started this several years ago, this program, I didn't know how that this aspect would work since everyone was remote. But the students have been really great about forming uh, uh, kind of study groups and friendships and professional connections through the program. And I mentioned earlier that the first course you would typically take is the math and econ course. And one of the things we built into the math and econ course was group work. A group, a, a group kind of project. And some of you might say, oh gosh, a group project. Uh, I don't want to do a group project. Well, you know, one of the things I've heard feedback when we do our surveys at the end from students is they really like that because it connected them with students in their cohort right off the bat. In the first course that they were involved in, they got to meet people. And in many cases, they maintain those relationships through the program. Uh, and uh, they formed uh, uh, online groups uh, study groups or just kind of a, a live kind of chat feed where when people needed help with something, they could go to that group and have that support. In addition, of course, to having the faculty member to support them uh, and our support staff to assist you uh, as needed. So that gives you kind of a window into to some of the, the structure of, of the courses and, and what it might look like uh, if you were to enroll in the program. Uh, Stephanie, please. So do you wanna say uh, something about the admissions uh, uh, process? Sure, so yes, we have an admissions team that works with you throughout the application process. We're happy to help answer your questions along the way. Um, if you can see here what we require for admission, we are accepting applications right now for the August 24th start date. I realize that sounds soon, but you're actually right on time. You still have time to apply and even apply for financial aid or set up payment plans if needed. But what we typically look for or what we need is at least a bachelor's degree. Um, you will upload your transcripts into the application and upload your resume and your goal statement essay. And of course, we'll send you the specific instructions for those. For the recommendation forms, we do things a little bit different. All you need to do is to list the two people's email addresses on your application, and then we will send them a form and they type on the form, they can type comments, and then they submit it online. So you don't have to worry about people typing a long letter and mailing it. They do have to be professional in nature though. So please try for a supervisor or co-worker, colleague, or former instructor. Um, oh, sorry about that. 
So you, a lot of people oftentimes call in and say, well, do I need specific prerequisites? They're not um, required, but you can see some recommended courses here at the bottom of the slide that will be particularly helpful. And we can definitely give you some guidance when you start to submit your admissions items on what to expect um, math wise in the program and emailing you the course descriptions so that you can make sure that you'll feel comfortable with the material. Okay, um, it does take about one to four weeks to receive the decision, usually within a week to 10 days, but sometimes it can take a little bit longer. So I recommend trying to apply as soon as possible. I would try your best to try to complete your file by around July 1st so that you'll get a timely admissions decision and have plenty of time to get your books and registration complete. And then you'll have a student success coach that will actually stay with you until you graduate. So that's a huge benefit of the online program. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Dr. Coyne? No, that, that's captured perfectly. The, the one thing I will say, um, based on, on the point you raised about the recommended but not required, so, so thank you for highlighting that because that is one of the most common questions I receive, is it is not an overstatement in any way, shape, or form to say our student body, so the people enrolled in the program, both currently but historically who have graduated, is extremely diverse uh, in terms of their background. And so to give you a sense, we will have people who major in economics undergrad, but even within that, we have people that graduated a year or two ago, so things are quite fresh. We ha have had others who graduated a decade, two decades ago. Many of our students took economics, but did not major in economics, and either their current interests or their career trajectory have taken them in a direction where they want to pr pursue further study in economics, and so they don't have the kind of background where compared to someone that just graduated undergraduate and is coming in. Uh, and that's okay. We've structured the program to enable people from a wide variety of backgrounds to uh, uh, both succeed in individual courses, but in the program overall. Now that's not to say certain aspects of the program might be more or less difficult depending on your background and your strengths, uh, but that's for any graduate program, even with a, a background in economics. Some people struggle, struggle in more things uh, in certain areas and not others. Uh, and so that's common, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions related to the program uh, or to uh, uh, those recommendations uh, and or anything else that's on your mind. Feel free to raise any questions at all that, that interest you. Well, Dr. Coyne, I can see a lot of questions rolling in here already. <laughs> So we'll, we'll try to make sure we have time to answer as many of these as we can here. Our first question is, do we offer any sort of a hybrid option for those that live local, um, you know, part in person and on ground? Yep, thank you for raising that question. It's one of the most common ones I receive. And the answer is no. And so when we were setting this up, um, we had to deal with, you know, it's an accredited program. I should say, I should mention that by the way. So I should. This is a fully accredited program. It is a George Mason University master's degree. And so when you're in the online program, when you graduate, you will get a master's degree like our on the ground program. You receive the same diploma. Your transcript uh, says MA in economics. It does not differentiate between the online and on the ground. And I mentioned that for, to clarify that because some people think, well, this is somehow a, a, a different program or it's not the same as the on the ground program. And from an accreditation degree standpoint, that's not true, they are exactly the same. The difference is the modality, the delivery form. And so in any case, we had to separate the programs and keep them distinct for purposes of getting approval for the accrediting agency of the university. And so students select into one or the other, the on the ground program or the online program, uh, and then they uh, have to stay in one of those two tracks. Thank you. And I believe I can answer the next question, but feel free to jump in, Dr. Coyne. Can full-time George Mason uh, employees with tuition waiver benefits of six credit hours any semester per term be applied toward this online Master of Arts in Economics? I have had plenty of Mason employees use their tuition benefits for the online program. 
And I do know that you, you don't have to go straight through the program. Um, you can take time off as long as you finish in, is it six years, Dr. Coyne? Correct. Okay, do you have anything to add to that or nope, is it pretty you're, common? You're, nope, you're exactly right, that, that's an option. And so real, again, really what it comes down to to link this up with the, the first question is to think about what modality uh, best suits your uh, kind of life and your goals. Uh, and so if it's the online program, again, this is from George Mason University's perspective, this program is a graduate program and has the same standing and status as other graduate programs. And so from that standpoint, it's exact same. And I should also mention for people in the online program, you get access to the GMU library, obviously remotely. I mean, if you were here, you could go because you're a George Mason student. But if you're remote, you can access all the online uh, uh, library materials, career services. You get access to all those things because you are a George Mason University student with all benefits and privileges. Really, the difference is for those of you not in Northern Virginia proper, you're remote. If you do live in the area, you are closer and you'll have act you could come on the campus and access those services like any other student could. So thank you for those questions. Yes, and they do even offer online tutoring if you ever need us to send you the link for the writing or math, um, with, which is within George Mason, not Correct. this department. Yeah. Um, okay, and this kind of leads us into the next question as well. Do the asynchronous uh, courses allow students to work ahead or are the modules released one at a time? Yes, yeah, so they, they are released um, how do I answer this? It's a mix for most courses. I want to make sure I'm answering clearly. I'm not trying to avoid the question. I don't, I don't want to confuse, you know, but, it's a, but I do want to give you as concrete as an answer as I can. And so let me, when I say it's mixed, here's what I mean. The materials are for, for the classes I've designed. Okay, I'll speak to those two. You could access all eight modules at once if you want to. What you can't access is the assignments because the assignments are time dated. And so let me give you a concrete example, again, for the micro one course that I just taught, okay, which again, I designed. The, each module has a discussion forum. So that's a chance to interact with your colleagues and to practice your writing skills. That has three posts. There's a quiz on the material. And then um, there's a study guide. And then there's a midterm and a final. You can only take, you can only do the discussion forum for each module during the week because it opens certain days and closes certain days. And the quiz opens certain days and closes certain days. The midterm opens and closes certain days. And so you certainly can go ahead with the material and, and you can read ahead, you can watch the videos, but you won't be able to complete the assessment and activities for each of the modules until the specified days of that module or that week, if that makes sense. Hopefully I answered your question clearly, if not, uh, I'll certainly do my best to, to clarify. So could a student then um, type up the answer to the discussion board question in Microsoft Word and wait for the window to open? Um, I, I, I am not sure the prompt is even available um, okay. in advance. I, I, that's a good question. I haven't actually thought of that. I, I, I don't know if the prompts for the discussion, because it's a prompt related to the, the weekly material. Um, but you know, two of them for the way, for my course, there's one that there's a prompt you have to directly engage the prompt. So if that was public, you could certainly um, pre-type it out, but then the other two, you have to engage other students, your colleagues. And again, I'm trying to get a kind of flow and conversation going. And of course there, you'd have to wait for your colleagues to enter their um, original posts in order to engage. And to me, it's really the best of both worlds because you have a lot of freedom, but it keeps you, a lot of students have said it keeps them on track from falling behind and just really digging in with the material rather than skimming over it. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, for most of the students and, 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 and given the diversity of backgrounds, this is not gonna speak to everyone, but most of the students, you know, doing the readings and keeping up, they're doing it week to week. And so most of them don't have time to get ahead, even if they wanted to. Um, but of course, depending on, on your um, capabilities and your other obligations, that, that might be something you'd want to do. And certainly you could read ahead. I mean, you'll have the course syllabus with the readings and the materials. So anyone that wanted to, to read ahead would be more than welcome to do so. Sure. And the next question has to do with what you're looking for in an ideal candidate for the program. So um, any feedback on acceptance rates or just what you're looking for in terms of a grade point average recommendations or anything else a student can do to boost their chances of admission? 
Yeah. And so, you know, I, I should mention again, I'm a, I'm a product of, of, of the graduate program. And before I did this, I was the director, uh, I was the graduate director. So I, I oversaw all both the PhD and the master's on the ground program before I designed this entire program and launched it. And so I've reviewed hundreds, if not thousands of graduate applications um, to our programs. Uh, and so I actually can answer this quite well. And I, by the way, I, I'm in charge of reviewing. I'm the head reviewer for all the applications to this program. And so, as Stephanie was saying, when you apply, it goes through the graduate uh, admissions process to make that's a box checking exercise. Do they have the right bachelor's? Do they have a bachelor's degree. Do they have the letters? But then, of course, the Department of Economics makes the decision on admission. So that's led by me. And so what am I looking for? You know, again, I, one of the things I really love and I know I keep harping on this, but I think it's one of the really neat aspects of the online format is that the applications we get are just enormously diverse in backgrounds, more so I think than on the ground programs, uh, uh, because the flexibility of this program allows professionals, it allows parents, it allows caregivers who can't attend classes in person to participate in a graduate education. And that's a really neat thing from my perspective as an educator. And so what am I looking for? I am looking for someone who wants to be here and who I believe will succeed. And so what are indicators of whether someone's gonna succeed in graduate school? Well, look, again, this is someone having read thousands of, of graduate applications and dealt with PhD and master's students for well over a decade. Some who are very successful, some who struggle and have a variety of issues, which is that past performance certainly tells you something, but not everything. So what do I mean by that? Some of our best students, and this is not an exaggeration, did very poorly on, in, as an undergraduate. And they just were you know, a goofy undergraduate. They goofed off their first or second semester. They didn't know what they wanted. They didn't take school seriously. And so their first year, first two years undergraduate, you know, they have a two something GPA. And then they got serious or somewhat serious and they improved. But some of these people have been working and are they're extremely successful professionals. Like all of us, they matured, they found their passion, they figured out things in life and they're extremely successful. So I would never look at someone who was extremely successful in their career and then they have a three or 2.7 GPA undergrad and say, wow, this person can't succeed in graduate school. That's just silly. Uh, uh, in that case, past performance in school doesn't capture that person today. And so the most important part of your application, from my perspective, which sometimes strikes people as counterintuitive, but, but hear me out, is the statement of purpose. All right. And here's why. You've already done what you've done in the past. It's what we call a sunk cost in economics. You can't change it. Uh, whether you have a 4.0 GPA as an undergraduate, a 2.5 or somewhere in between, it, it's, it is what it is. Uh, what you can control is the narrative about yourself. And so I urge you to spend time on that statement of purpose and to avoid simple kind of platitudes. You know, I want to come to George Mason University because it's great. It's premier, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Th those are nice things to say. I like them, of course but it doesn't tell me anything about you. The best statements of purpose say, here's kind of me. This is what I do in, in life. This is what, what, what I'm passionate about. This is why I, I want the degree. Uh, this is why George Mason University's program is a fit for me. And here's why I'll succeed. And so the best letters are ones where I walk away and I'm like, wow, this is a really interesting person. And I think they're gonna flourish here because they're interesting and because they clearly know what they want. And that's the real predictor of success. You know, some people call it grit. Some people call it drive. It's, it's knowing what you want. And I'm presuming that if you're applying to a graduate degree, you know, people don't typically select into a graduate degree to goof off. That would be an odd thing to do. You typically select into a graduate degree because you're a serious person who is serious in, about intellectual study. And so that's what we're looking for. And here's the other thing I just want to mention to you. If you did perform badly in the past, just own it. Just talk about it. Say, here's why I, I, I didn't do well. And that doesn't reflect me today. 
I always think the the ones that kind of the applications that are somewhat marginal are the ones that don't do a good job communicating why they're a fit for the program and communicating about themselves, but also they have that weak performance and they don't own it. They just kind of push it under the rug as if it didn't happen. And I always greatly appreciate when people just say like, yeah, you know, I was immature or I had some life challenge. People have personal challenges. They have family challenges. All of us do. And so whatever it is, you don't have to go into great detail. You certainly don't have to reveal any information you're uncomfortable revealing. So I'm not trying to suggest that, but just tell a narrative about yourself. Just be yourself. And if you're able to do that, uh, you'll have a great chance of being accepted into the program. No guarantee, of course. Uh, but it's, it sets you up for the admissions committee to have a good sense of who, who you are. Letters of recommendation matter, of course, but they're marginal. Uh, uh, you know, all of us pick letter writers that are going to say good things about you. So they matter. I read them and I take them into account. But that statement of purpose uh, uh, is, is one of, if not the most important aspect of, of the application process. So again, I urge you to spend time on that and just tell your story. That's what we want to hear. Very good. And good news, um, we do not require the GRE for this program. That was a question here. And another question about calculus. Um, do you feel that calculus one would be sufficient to cover the recommended prerequisite calculus coursework or is a course in multivariable calculus preferred? And we, we covered that these are not mandatory prerequisites, but um, would you could you give us any further feedback on that, Dr. Coyne? Certainly. And so we recommend a, a working knowledge of Calc 1. If you, you know, all else constant, the more the merrier. So if you have multivariate, if you have additional math courses, uh, uh, that's great. If not, uh, uh, again, that doesn't, certainly doesn't mean you can't succeed. There might be certain concepts in the math class or in micro two that might, you might struggle with. It might be harder than others. But again, that's for all of us. Uh, and, and let me say this, you know, I, the, the way we've structured this is to empower you to succeed. And so we put math econ first to kind of serve as an entry point to refresh people's memory who have been out of that way of thinking for a while. Because even if you took math as an undergraduate, but you graduated a long time ago, you know, you might have just forgotten if you haven't been using it on the daily, right? just like many of us would forget things we haven't used on a regular, on a daily basis. And so that, that math econ course is meant as a, as a segue into the program. Um, you know, one of the, the things I always suggest is, um, you know, that there's a series of books, they're called Shams Outlines, S-C-H-A-U-M. Um, and there's a whole series of Shams Outlines. One of them is Introduction to Mathematical Economics. And if you get your hands on Shams Outlines, uh, uh, Introduction to Math Econ, which you can get on Amazon, it's in paperback, and you go through that and you feel comfortable with, with most of it, uh, you'll be okay. The other thing I, I want to mention to you is the structure of the program, the sequence for those of you who are concerned about the math. So you start with Math Econ, Micro One is next, and I developed that. And Micro One is heavily theory based. So there's very little math in it. And it is making sure that you have fully internalized how to think like an economist. So you have the math in math econ. Micro one, you're gonna get price theory. This is microeconomics hammered into you. It's, it's micro over theory over and over again. Then you go to micro two. Micro two is a combination of those two. So it is very heavily math-based micro. Uh, and how varying is the textbook, uh, his, his microeconomics textbook, and it combines the math you learned in math econ with the theory you learned in micro one, and it combines those things together. And so you can see how that three core sequence segues one to the next, but also reinforces those concepts. And so you're getting the, the math, you're getting the theory, and then you're reinforcing both together and combining them, and you'll see how they fit together. And so that's the kind of structure and purpose of that. And so that's how I think about it. And, you know, the other thing I should just mention is, you know, the, the wonderful thing about online, the online world today is there's so many resources. So you can find online math econ courses, not for credit necessarily, just for your own self-paced study if you want a refresher uh, and you want to spend time walk, walking you through that. Um, and so uh, uh, those are some 
general guidelines, I, and, and I don't want to overstate in either direction. And, and let me just say one more thing before I move on. You know, I, 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 you could go take three calculus courses and then come to the program and still struggle. And then I don't want you to turn around and say, like, you know, you told me I wouldn't struggle. Well, you could struggle for some other confounding factor that is beyond my knowledge at this time. Uh, uh, or you could take, uh, have no math background or one course and struggle with aspects uh, of the program. But we've also had students that come in and flourish with that. And so it's really a diverse set of, of skills that people have and, and whether they succeed or not is based on a variety of factors. But one of the reasons that I really wanna urge you to form uh, uh, study groups is because it is a way for you to have an additional resource, which is your colleagues in the cohort and to leverage the diverse backgrounds that people have, because some people will be really good in math. Some people might be better in the, in the straight up theory courses. Uh, and so you can get that support system built in if you form those study groups early on. Yes, and if anyone is concerned about the math also, we have um, some of the resources of what you'll encounter in the program math-wise. So let your admissions representative know or email online to at gmu.edu and uh, we have those resources that we can recommend. Okay, um, the next one is, uh, this is a great one for you, Dr. Coyne, given your education. After the Master of Arts program, if someone wants to apply to a PhD program in the future, typically how long would the PhD take? <clears throat> Great question. Uh, and so it varies. And so I'm going to give you a range because the, that's just the reality of it. And so when you go into a PhD program, um, and I think this is true for almost all PhD programs, there might be an outlier here or there, but I feel comfortable saying this is a, a near universal. Uh, you start over. And so you, 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 you take a dedicated micro macro sequence in the PhD program, even if you've taken it as a master's student. Uh, sometimes you're able to, to wave out of like a math econ course or one of the economy master's courses based on your performance in a master's, but that's program specific. So let's say you didn't get any transfer credit. So you had to start from scratch. A PhD in economics would take four to six years for full time full-time, that's start to finish, that's coursework, that is exams, and that is electives. And when I say coursework, that's core classes and electives, and then your dissertation, of course. And it depends, that, that range depends on you, of course, and how quickly you move, especially through the dissertation stage, but also the program itself and your field. Some fields take longer. And so some fields, uh, for instance, experimental economics, they often end up, uh, those who specialize in experimental economics, oftentimes take six years. Um, others take, you know, outside of that field, uh, and you don't have to take six years in experimental, it's just often the case. Uh, others take four or five years. And so that's, that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. And can online students enrolled in this online format um, have the ability to get involved in other facets of George Mason, such as the Mercatus Center? <clears throat> Great question. And so uh, the Mercatus, it depends what you mean getting involved in Mercatus. The Mercatus Center offers a fellowship for master students, but that is only for on the ground students right now. So that has not been extended to the online uh, program um, because it's a highly, in addition to classwork, there's also, it's a very policy uh, focused fellowship and there's a lot of kind of face-to-face uh, -face, hands-on work to, with policy scholars as part of that fellowship. Um, there, there may be opportunities to participate in other uh, kind of programs that they run, some of their uh, other like reading groups and things along those lines, uh, but it is certainly not a major component of the program. And I don't wanna give you any false sense that there's a, a large number of opportunities that currently exist. And so if they do exist, uh, uh, they'll be uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, on the outskirts, meaning that they're not part of the program itself. Um, but even for the on the ground people, by the way, unless you're part of the Mercatus Masters program, um, th those opportunities don't exist. So from that standpoint, the online program's no different. Um, but so it's not zero, but it's also not like there's a set strut of programs I can point you to is what I'm trying to communicate. Now, outside of that, are, are there other opportunities? Uh, it's the same for the on-the-ground master students. 
Uh, and that is that they have to seek out those opportunities, whether it's with fac particular faculty members uh, or other opportunities. And so to the extent there's anything in the department that is online, you are welcome to attend those events and participate and uh, be, be an active participant in those opportunities because you're a student at George Mason University. What you won't have access to is any face-to-face -face, uh, opportunities. So, you know, our weekly seminars, a lot of those are face-to-face -face in person. Uh, so obviously if you're remote, you wouldn't be able to participate in those. Um, but if you're in the area, of course, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and so, so that gives you a sense of, of some of the things that you might be able to pursue it and not for that, for that matter. Okay. And I believe I can take um, the next question. Do courses take place concurrently during the semester or does each course take place at a separate time, such as over an eight week period? I know that we normally starting in the first semester register you for one eight week class on the front half of the semester and then one on the back half. So there's an a, a fall A term and a fall B term. And usually that they'll register you for one at a time. Now, can students double up further down the road on courses if they wish to take concurrent eight-week classes, Dr. Coyne? Certainly, certainly. Uh, you know, we, here's the, my thought on this. My thought is that the one course, eight-week course at a time, it, it's a lot. Your, your plate will be full. But some people have wanted to take more, as Stephanie was just saying. It, the, that, that's a minority of, of students in the program, I should say. Uh, but what we try to do is communicate to the student what's entailed in taking those courses to give you as much information as we can, not to tell you what to do, because you're an adult, but to empower you to make the best decision for yourself. And so we certainly have had students who double up. It's a lot. Um, and, and, and they've had mixed results. Some of them don't do as well as they would like because I think they took on too much. Uh, others, again, flourish because they can handle the workload or because maybe their work or professional or personal life, pardon me, uh, for that for those eight weeks allowed them to dedicate extra time to those courses, in which case uh, that's great. And so my own view is, uh, you know, empower people with information and then they take, they take the, the courses that are best for them and the course, the path uh, in their life that's best for them given that information. Yes, and you'll have a student success coach. So if it gets to the point where you're considering double up, doubling up, just reach out to your success coach. They can advise you and create a um, progression plan for you and just work with you to do what would be right for you. And then the next question is about scholarships. Are there any specific scholarships? I know that we send the students the links to the General Mason scholarships with the recap of the program when they inquire. Are there any specific scholarships that you know of specifically within the department? Yeah, for not for the MA online. And so, as I mentioned, there's the Mercatus MA fellowships for the on the ground program. Um, but not for the online MA. And so as of right now, there are no department dedicated scholarships for this program. But they, as Stephanie was saying, there is a general uh, kind of database that Mason, the university that is maintains of, of opportunities that you can pursue. And we'll put our contact in, well, it's actually right here on the screen. So if you email us, we'll send you the link to those um, Mason scholarships. And the next question is, given the rising prominence of AI in various fields, does the economics program offer any coursework that encompasses the application of AI in economics? Yeah, that's a great question. As of right now, we do not. Um, and that's the same for, our, for the on the ground program. Now, that said, my colleagues who I mentioned earlier, Tyler Cowan and Alex Tabrak, recently wrote a paper, um, which you can Google and find online, uh, it's called something like AI and teaching economics or AI and economics. And they outline numerous ways that uh, very much in line with your question, um, AI is going to change, it may change the trajectory of both economic education, but uh, doing economics in general. And so you might find that of, of personal interest um, given, given that question. Okay, and then um, we just have two more questions so far, but one question is, George Mason is an excellent school. Thank you for that. But it does have a reputation for a more conservative leaning. Is that reflected in this program? How standard or non-standard is the economics education I'll be receiving and how does it compare nationally? Yeah, well, thank you for that. 
Uh, I've certainly heard this before. Um, and, uh, you know, let, let me say a couple of things about this. Um, you know, of course, a lot of this de depends on what one defines as a conservative um, or, or what counts as that. I'm not trying to engage in semantics, but, but let, me, let me explain why, why I'm saying that. I actually think our department, and if you look at our faculty, and you can look, at, look up our faculty online and study what we've done, we are an extremely diverse set of faculty in terms of the research we do and, and the views that we hold in terms of, of the output of our research. And so we have faculty who have made an argument. So my, my, my colleague, Brian Kaplan, has a book called Open Borders. All right, so he is a proponent when it comes to immigration. He makes these arguments on economics grounds for near complete opening of borders, um, which most people wouldn't think of as a conservative position. I have other colleagues who uh, uh, want more restrictions on, um, uh, 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 on immigration. Uh, and then we have people in between. Uh, all of them coming at this, not from an ideological perspective, but from a uh, economic perspective. We have people who work on a variety of issues related to development and foreign policy, who have a, a variety of different views and conclusions they draw from their research on these things. And so uh, uh, I, think, I think from that perspective, we are quite a diverse department. Now, that all said, uh, people have the view that, that, that you pointed out, so it's a good question. And so what's the program like? The program is, is a standard economics program. And so you look, if you look at those core classes that I mentioned, math, econ, micro one, micro two, macro econometrics, you will find those same five courses, perhaps with different titles, at any economics department offering a master's degree. All right. Um, those are standard courses. There's no, nothing unique about them, uh, uh, about those five courses. You move to the electives. Causal inference is a, as I mentioned earlier, a statistics slash um, econometrics course. Uh, and the unique things then come in in experimental public and market process. And those are unique fields to George Mason. Um, of course, experimental economics, many schools have now. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no ideological content to those courses. Uh, they focus on certain aspects of economics and the study of economics. Uh, so I, I wouldn't characterize them as conservative or liberal or anything in between. Uh, I, would, I would say that they are economics courses in the tradition that I mentioned earlier, that Masonomics tradition. Uh, and so where does, where does our program rank nationally? Well, it depends on what rankings you look at. And, you know, so you always have to be wary of these rankings, you know, because it, let me give you an example. You know, in some of these online MA programs, we're in the top five. If you look at our on the ground master's program, somewhere around 30 often is where we, we come in up for the on the ground program. That's national. Uh, and so what does that mean? I don't know what it means. You know, I've, I've always thought, here's my, my thought on this. It's only one thought, but I'll, I'll share it with you nonetheless. I say it's only one thought so you can gather other information. Look, uh, you could try out for, you know, the basketball playoffs are going on in the NBA right now. You could try out for the NBA and I could try out for the NBA. And we could have, a, a, that people could rank us as NBA prospects. Uh, and, and that there'd be some number attached to us. But once you're outside, the top tier, whatever that is, the top 100, 200 players, whether you're ranked 1,000 or 2,000, it matters nothing at all in the world. It doesn't matter on the margin. And so what's going to matter is if you can get into those top tier programs. So the number one ranked master's program in economics, I think, in the country is NYU, if I remember correctly. So certainly that matters a great deal, going to a school like that, because that's the number one ranked program. But once you get out of the, the top four, five, 10 programs, then it's really a matter of fit for you and what, what fits your lifestyle and what fits your career aspirations. And so that's how I would think about it if I were you as you're, as you're considering it. It's like, you know, what fits with what you wanna do both in terms of the structure of the program, the course selection, the topics, but the faculty as well. Uh, and the nice thing about my colleagues and myself is that uh, like many academics, we're very open with what we do. So you, all our websites are online, our research is online, we have videos online, you can go check us out, think about it and see if it's a good fit for you. 
Wonderful. And the last couple of questions, because I know we're coming upon uh, time here, I believe we've already answered, um, but I'll just go over that again in case anyone joined late. So we have three semesters in the year. Every year there's spring, summer, and fall, but students take one eight-week class at a time. So you're taking two courses in a semester, one on the front half and one on the back half. And most people finish in five semesters, um, but you do have up to a six-year time limit, so three semesters a year. So you, if you were asking over how many semesters, it, that would be 18 if you did it that way. But I would talk to your success co coach first to make sure that the classes would be available when you need them. So you'll have a success, a success coach, sorry, will handle your registration for you. And before you decide to take any time off, just reach out to them and they can plot it all out for you to make sure that you can finish as soon as possible if you're trying to maximize your tuition assistance or something from the employer. Um, and all of our electives are listed right here. So that was a question about banking and money electives. Um, these are your choices of electives on the screen. Anything else to add to that, Dr. Coyne? Uh, nope, nope, that's com comprehensive and accurate, so thank you. Okay, well, just once again, um, to reiterate, you do still have time to apply for the August 24th fall term of this year. We do not require the GRE. Um, you still have time to go ahead and get your application in. You can apply here at masononline.gmu.edu. You can call us tomorrow. We'll be available at 703-348-5006. We're always happy to answer your questions. You can email us at online2 at gmu.edu. And I'd like to thank Dr. Coyne for taking the time to be so specific and put this presentation for us. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us. And uh, best of luck, whatever it is you choose, choose to do. Thank you again. Thank you. And we hope to hear from you soon. Take care.